Americans that lose coverage every month due to the public health emergency unwinding, who would be able to stay on if Medicaid expansion was in place. Our team will continue to work hard to have all of the tools ready and necessary to move forward on expansion just as soon as we have clarity from the General Assembly about our ability to do so. Uh, we want to thank the partners at our county departments of social services and a number of stakeholders all across the state who have worked hard to hire up and to put the processes in place to make sure that we're ready so that North Carolina can go live just as soon as possible. This is an historic opportunity to provide and increase access to care for North Carolinians. And we will continue to do everything we can to bring it to bear as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Um, if anyone has any questions, we are ready to take this. This is Travis with uh, WRAL. Um, what about what uh, Representative Lambeth was saying last week, and I imagine others have voiced that, hey, we're far enough along, we're going to make the week of September 11th, and you know what it's going to say, more or less, so you ought to be able to move forward, uh, and the feds ought to be able to work with us. So what can you respond specifically to that? So going from authority to go live expansion is actually a 90 to 120 day process. It requires um, a great deal of consultation, um, public comment periods, uh, mailing notices to hundreds of thousands of people, not to mention technology changes and training for folks. Uh, by working on that process while we waited for authority, we were able to shrink that timeline down to 30 days. That's why we needed it by September 1. But there's still some things that we would have to do that we really cannot do uh, without the official thumbs up. Uh, which is why this is going to delay us at this point. And again, while they may uh, have a budget uh, the middle week of September, uh, we need an enacted budget or even easier uh, decoupling authority. And just to follow up, uh, does that mean the go live date would likely be about 30 days after uh, final passage? So there's really several variables we have to determine uh, right now, um, depending on how far it slips for them to give us the final authority to move forward. It could be December at the earliest. It could slip into 2024. Um, we're going to work to try to make that happen as soon as possible. Um, but again, we need their thumbs up to move forward. And we have a question from Richard Craver with the Winston-Salem Journal next. Uh, yes, Secretary. Uh, can you give us an update on where CMS standing on all the issues that y'all were trying to do some preemptive actions for? Yeah, so we have been working closely with CMS, and I'm grateful for the Biden administration's partnership on a number of fronts, uh, several technology changes to make it easier for folks to um, get access to Medicaid uh, through healthcare.gov. Um, a number of other technology changes in place. Uh, they've been reviewing our um, state plan amendments and other documents um, quickly. Uh, and so they stand ready uh, to can do all the final touches uh, just as soon as we can get authority from the General Assembly to move forward. And I had uh, one follow-up question. You've had two months now of disenrollment figures. Uh, those figures, you think they're going to be the sort of the average of what we're going to see per month? Do you feel like they'll go up or down um, as you go further into the the um, this, um, the evaluations? You know, we want folks to be covered. We want them to be covered by the program that they are eligible for. Um, the temporary period of time that the public health emergency paused redeterminations was an expansion of coverage across our country at a time uh, where people needed access to health care, and we were glad for it. Um, but built into that law signed by President Trump that expanded access to care was a period of time at which we would be contracting that access, which we're now going through. Um, right now, the estimates that we're seeing month to month is about what we expected as far as the number of folks going through the process. And again, 9,000 of those people would be able to likely stay on if we had expansion in place. 
place. Uh, we have worked hard to ensure uh, that we're leveraging all the flexibilities provided by CMS. Uh, we're working with our partners at the managed care plans. We have done significant updates to our technology uh, to reach folks um, just as much as possible to make sure we can help support them through the eligibility process uh, to continue to get people covered, uh, again, to any program that they're eligible for. And we have a question from Gary Robertson with the AP Next. Uh, hey, Secretary, I just want to uh, peel back a little bit on why you'd have to wait till December 1st. Why uh, Why couldn't you do this November 1st? Is there something special about November 1st that's just not, not doable? There's a number of issues that we have to manage around. One is uh, quarterly cash flow issues. Uh, so the Medicaid program is funded uh, via assessing um, certain hospitals and insurance plans. We know that that's how Medicaid expansion is funded as well, but we do those assessments um, broadly each quarter. That cash plus cash that we get from the legislature, the interaction of that and when we can go live, that's a piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is also uh, during the open enrollment period, certain technology changes that we need in place at healthcare.gov because we leverage the federal marketplace, counter interact with some of the things that they need to do to make sure that that system is stable for open enrollment. Uh, there's also beneficiary notifications and a number of other things that have to happen. And so just orchestrating all of those things, just like a good Thanksgiving dinner is challenging. Uh, we're going to look at every possible date. Our passion and mission and hopefully what we have been clear about is the effort to bend every single thing possible to get this done just as soon as possible. The next 30-day period is different from the last 30-day period. There are different obstacles. We continue to look at those closely. Thank you. And we also have a question from Mary Helen Jones with Spectrum. Hello. Thank you for your time, Secretary. From the time that expansion was signed into law until now, what are some of those things your department has been able to do to speed up the process? And also, what has it been like communicating with people who are either losing coverage, not able to gain coverage yet, because I'm sure some of them think that they could have had coverage, should have had coverage months ago? Well, first and foremost, I want to th thank our counties, uh, their leadership um, at their local departments of social services who lead the eligibility work. Um, between March and now, we've done a number of things. We've updated our technology systems that do eligibility. Uh, we've made significant investment in them to modernize our access to ex parte data, other income information that individuals may submit either through SNAP benefits or through other third party access to make it easier for our eligibility workers to have access to the information that they need to review and either approve or deny an application. Um, we have been working to partner with our managed care organizations who uh, you know, have been serving individuals that are either currently covered or maybe covered through other commercial um, entities to make sure we can identify and communicate with folks. Uh, we have been doing stakeholder work with a number of different groups all across the state who have a vested interest in expanding access to care, our community health centers, our uh, faith communities, um, other civic organizations who know how important this is. We've been working with our sheriffs and local law enforcement entities uh, to, again, try to close the gap where people often get stuck between the criminal justice system and the healthcare system. So there's been a significant amount of investment uh, in technology systems and processes. We've also identified resources at the department to fund to our local county government so they could hire up eligibility workers, train them, be ready, recognizing the workforce challenges that they currently face. There's been a significant amount of work done to get ready. People are ready to do this. Uh, and I know that our counties first and foremost see the value. Um, but you also asked about uh, individuals that have been impacted. We've seen these stories play out uh, in a number of uh, really well done uh, um, articles and other media coverage um, about individuals that are just dollars away. Um, from their ability to have health care, who are losing something and now having to find thousands more to pay for their health insurance, I'm sorry, to pay for their uh, prescriptions, to pay for their doctor visits. Uh, and that's just untenable for many families. 80% 
of the people who will benefit from Medicaid expansion come from working families. Many of these individuals are working two or more jobs. Uh, a lot of them are working in the child care industry, which we know is so critical for the health and development of children and for their parents to work as well. Uh, this is an investment that is long overdue for the people of North Carolina, and we're eager to get it done. We also have a question from Jason DeBruin with WUNC. Hi, Secretary. Thanks for the question. Uh, you talked about, you know, this doesn't need a budget to be passed. You could also just simply decouple this from the budget. Have you gotten any explanation about why that is not a possibility or, or why the legislature isn't going forward with that, especially given that we are expecting a budget pretty soon now? Well, I, what we have heard from the General Assembly is, is essentially what you just said, that there is that they're close on a budget, uh, and so they're going to focus on that, and uh, and this will just kind of come with that. Um, okay, uh, I would have liked a budget um, some time ago, an authority some time ago, and I also hope that there's a number of other things in that budget that they're negotiating, investments in behavioral health. Uh, we know that behavioral health rates haven't been increased since 2012, investment in state staff. We have a 26% vacancy rate at the department that provides critical health care for people all across the state. Uh, so I'm eager for a budget too, uh, and hopefully we can get to the finish line soon. It looks like we have a question in the chat. It says, given the concern about job vacancies in state government, how confident are you that there is adequate staff to get people enrolled when the opportunity is available? Because of phenomenal work done by our Medicaid team, we're actually going to be able to move half of who we expect to be enrolled in Medicaid expansion um, on day one. Uh, these are 300,000 individuals currently in a much less benefit in the Medicaid program, people who have come uh, to us and been found not eligible for Medicaid. So we put them in the family planning benefit, which is a very light, minimal benefit that we operate. Uh, we know who those individuals are because of our technology investments. We have access to the more recent income information to know that they are still eligible. So we're going to be able to move them over automatically. Second, I alluded to earlier some of the technology changes that we have made in our relationship with the federal government. So as people go through healthcare.gov to determine their eligibility in open enrollment, um, they're going to be determined through that process that they may not be eligible for a subsidy benefit on the ACA, but they may be eligible for Medicaid expansion. That data will now um, flow to us electronically so we can process those applications. Um, all to say that we put a number of steps in place to greatly reduce the burden um, on our local county eligibility workers and the number of times that a human will actually need to be involved in these processes. Uh, and so I feel quite confident about our readiness um, to uh, bring these people into coverage. There's another question in the chat from Travis. Um, he says, making sure I understand the family planning benefit, those will all be women who qualify for a Medicaid program now that largely just pays for birth control. Is that correct? There's more than just women in the program. There's reproductive health broadly. Uh, and so there's other individuals in that in that program as well. We have some statistics on that. We'll be happy to share. Are there any other questions from uh, 